Hey guys, it's Grumpa Lovig is here and with another vlog. And this is um this is kind of about a movie I watched the other day. I really didn't expect to be doing as many of these really. Uh, let's see if we can frame them a little better. There we go. Since he's so beautiful, he can be in the middle of the frame. Um, it's not quite centered though, is it? Eh. Um well Blu-ray the other day, and oh, uh, just just so you know, spoiler alert: this will be covering specific scenes in the movie, and I will try to add stills where where I can find them as uh, as is necessary to the discussion. So, oh, and he's down for the count. So, like I said, I got my first Blu-ray the other day. And it is Angels and Demons, uh, the follow-up to The Da Vinci Code, starring uh, the none other than Tom Hanks. I really liked the first one, so I thought I would give Angels and Demons a try. I've never seen it. It's fairly old. Um, here is the case. Hello! That's my little wrist break, sorry. Sometimes my wrist hurts a lot. But before we really get into the details of the movie, and there's only a couple of scenes that I really wanted to discuss, I will preface this with saying that I I don't go into movies trying to pick out bad points. I don't go in saying that, oh, this is going to be horrible or whatever. If I'm watching it, I'm trying to immerse myself. I'm trying to let my brain go not think about it. Just have fun entertainment. But there are some times when not even that can keep the immersion, uh, the immersion going and be like, well, you, you know what's going to happen. It's so blatantly obvious that even though you have like, blinders on practically, you can see it coming. And sometimes I just, it disturbs me in movies because I try not to do you know, I try not to foresee what's coming or whatever. My husband will hit me like first five minutes and like, oh, I can tell you this is a bad guy. Da, 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 da. And this is what's going to happen because it's all been done before. I'm like, well, why are you watching it? There's no point to watching it if you're just going to do that because it's, it's entertainment. It's supposed to be fun and distract you from life for a bit. So. So I try not to think too much about stuff like that. I mean, sometimes they're intellectual movies, which is fine, so it's okay to engage your brain, but other times, you know, there's no such thing as a new thought or idea or whatever, so I like to give them the benefit of the doubt. So in this movie, um, you know, I was pretty sucked in. It was fairly good, fairly fast paced. I didn't find it quite as intriguing as the first one. Even though there was more tension, more drama, whatever, it was more bloody gory type, it seemed like. They were just trying to get a different audience, and so it didn't quite appeal to me as much. But, you know, you kind of get the feeling that the good guy's going to be the bad guy, etc, etc. But then there comes a scene when it's just so blatantly obvious, you can no longer just disregard your feelings towards that subject. Now, the scene I'm talking about, and this is a spoiler alert part, alert part is um, the, I can't even remember his name, I don't know, the guy who is played by Cameron Lango, Ewan, Ewan, Ewan McGregor, plays this dude, Cameron Lango, and he was adopted by the Pope, blah, 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 and the Pope ends up being murdered, and they find out, and it's this big, long, drawn-out thing. And you kind of get the feeling that he's, like, the bad guy. Um, and then there's the scene where they've all been, like, the, these other cardinals have been branded and stuff, and it's the Pope's turn, but there is no Pope. And so Cameron Lango is the acting Pope until one is... What do they call it? Elected? I don't know. I'm not Catholic. Um, I do like the current Pope, though, but that's beside the point. Um, so, they're like, oh, the Kimberlin goes in danger. He's going to get branded. And then everyone breaks in and they see this guy holding a gun.
And the guy's like, he, he's got a gun, shoot him! Kimalinga dude is like, he's got a gun, shoot him, shoot him, he's trying to kill me, blah blah blah. And then it's just so blatantly obvious that the dude with the gun didn't do anything. Like, it's not pointed at the dude, nothing. Even when they like, try to make it more suspenseful before you before the movie shows what's going on, even then you're like, wait, there's something wrong with that. It's just like, hello, that can't be right. They just shoot him and like, there's this pause too. And I'm like, okay, why didn't someone be like, hey, wait, he's not a threat or something. I mean, there was enough time for someone else to react before the dude was shot and killed. Just seemed wrong like psychologically I guess but they were probably doing it obviously and then this other cardinal I think he was a cardinal comes rushing in and he's like he's yelling at this Carmen what is his name Carmelango Camerlango I don't know is that the last name or whatever I just assumed it was his last name it could be his title they never address him by really anything else, so I'm not sure if that's his name or whatever. But he comes in and calls the dude a bastard, the bishop dude comes in, he's like, you bastard! And then he rushes into the room, he picks up the fire poker, and he goes to hit him, and then the camera like that dude's like, Illuminati, Illuminati, shoot him! And I'm like, okay, that's, that's even weirder because the older guy is... He's slower, he doesn't make contact, they could have just run up and restrained him, but yet they shot him and killed him. I'm like, okay, clearly they have evidence that he doesn't want anyone else to know about. And then the reveal is kind of weird too, like this is hidden camera, so dude knew, all, dude knew all along, the guy who had the gun in the room, and then they show the scene and it's just like, you Camerlango guy brands himself and it's really weird and then there's like this bomb antimatter bomb scene and like kind of the whole movie you're thinking to yourself I bet you the bad guy is that dude and he did it all so he could be both and sure enough that's how it turns out to be but you can kind of lose yourself in it and not really think about it until you get to the point with the room and the fireplace and the branding thing and then this guy turns out that he was pilot and everything and he has this thing planned down to a T and it's kind of like, it's kind of like he's acting from that point, like you can tell he's acting, it's not like, it. I think Ewan McGregor is an amazing actor and I'm not questioning his skills, as a matter of fact, I mean he has to be really good to act like he's acting, I mean that is, yeah, you know what I mean? It's a whole new level of weirdness, though. But then, like, he goes and he gets the antimatter bomb, and she's like, well, it's really cold. The, oh, there's this scientist lady who developed, helped develop the antimatter extraction or whatever. And she's like, well, the battery might be less than five minutes. I, I don't know if I should change the battery because then the remaining stasis won't contain it and it'll, and it'll explode. And the camera like a guy's like, no! And he just grabs it and runs. And I'm thinking to myself, well... As far as it was explained to me, it won't fail until at least five minutes, so why didn't he let her change the battery first, at the very least, instead of running off with it, ensuring that it will, exp it will explode? So there's a convenient helicopter outside, and he's like, blah blah blah, I'm taking this up, it's an emergency, so he takes it up. And you're thinking, like, it's like, okay, you're kind of a bursting at that point, he's back to being the good guy in you know in my mind and so he's made himself a martyr i'm like okay well why can't he have a parachute and jump out and then the helicopter goes up and up and up and up and up and he waits till the battery is flashing and miraculously he has a parachute and he jumps out and he lives he's injured but you know well he lives and then the explosion is like really cool i love the visuals on it it like knocks people down and the visual effects in this movie you can't tell really where they are but I mean I wasn't really scrutinizing it with much detail like in great depth because um, <clears throat> because I like to try to lose myself in certain things you know there's no point in doing it if I'm not getting any enjoyment out of it I don't want to think 
I just want to kind of turn off my brain and go along for the ride, which I don't know if that makes me a good movie viewer or a bad movie viewer, but I get pissed. I get. I get. I get so pissed off. I get pissed off when my husband's always like, "Well, you know, that's the plot point," and I'm like, "Well, yeah, I already figured it out." But I've pushed that back to my the back part of my brain, and I haven't been thinking about it. Thanks for bringing it to the forefront and ruining the movie for me, type thing. There's only so much that you could overlook and push back into your brain. Um, so that kind of, I mean, it's a good portion through the movie. I mean, I think there's only like 10 minutes left of the movie at that point, but it kind of ruins it for me. I don't think I'll be able to go back and rewatch it, even though I freaking just bought it. But I mean, $5 is cheaper than an admission to a movie nowadays. I mean, there are just certain points in a movie that will make me be like, okay, I'm done, I'm not watching this, I'm not giving it the benefit of the doubt. Sometimes violence will do that, but there was this one point, like, this is kind of a tangent, just to kind of help illustrate my thought process and viewing of movies. I'm a Trekkie. I love Star Trek. Um, my favorite is gotta be the next generation, though. But I like Data is like my favorite character and Spock is really, really close. Like I think maybe they're actually on par with each other. Leonard Nimoy was awesome. I watched the new Star Trek movie with the new cast and everything. I wasn't too thrilled about it, but I was like, well, maybe they'll reboot the television series. That'd be cool. You know, maybe we'll get more Star Trek. I mean, I know Gene Roddenberry wouldn't have any influence over it, really, other than his artistic dream, because he's been dead since Next Generation. I didn't really get into Deep Space Nine or anything, but I watched the movie, and there was the point. Like, I could get into the whole time paradox alternate reality thing, which, okay, so they give themselves a clean slate. They don't have to go by any of the lore or any of that stuff. I forget what that's called. Official timeline... I forget, but anyway, you guys, you should know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> um, but when they destroy, oh, this is another spoiler. When Vulcan blew up, that was it. That that was the end for me. I couldn't, I couldn't immerse myself in this universe anymore because Vulcan was such an important part of Spock, <clears throat> and his mother was like. Like, oh, okay, the mother's there. I'm like, okay, oh no, Vulcan's dead. You know, it's blown up. Crap. There goes my favorite episodes and all kind of stuff. And so they no longer exist. And then you've seen, oh, his mom's there. Okay. Well, that means they could that my episode could potentially still happen. And then she falls off and dies. And I was like, nope. That's it. Spock. Spock's mom was such an important part of his development that I cannot... I don't want to be a part of a universe that, that has that not happen, you know? Like, it was just so disappointing for me. I didn't, I, I saw, I saw the next one too, I think, but I wasn't really into it. I, I don't know. So for that reason, since the same guy directed Star Wars, which I like Star Wars, which I've heard it's really good, but I don't know, I'm just iffy about seeing it anymore because it's already ruined Star Trek for me. Thank you.